Okay, thank you. Um, in fact, I gave the same short 15 minute talk last year uh, where I described the problem and explained the approach I had about the problem at that point. So I'll more or less repeat that talk, except that a sequence of very lucky events happened to me during the last one year. The first of them being the Karima Di Prasito, uh, one of the co-workers in this project, uh, came to IAS as a member. And we sat down and started talking about the problem. And everything turned out to be much better than expected. So in the first half of the talk, I'll repeat myself in last year, tell you the problem. And in the latter half, I'll explain uh, what's behind the problem. So in its most basic version, the problem concerns graphs. As you know, graph is just a one-dimensional space with vertices and edges. It could be small or large, simple or complicated, but it is what it is. They have just two components, vertices and edges. And whenever you have a graph, you can associate numerical invariants, one of them being the chromatic polynomial. So this is a function that I'll write by a chi of g, where g is your graph whose value at positive integer q is the number of proper colorings of your graph using q colors. So you color the vertices of your graph using two different colors whenever they are connected by an edge. This function turns out to be a polynomial in the variable q. For example, if you compute the chromatic polynomial for this small graph on four vertices, the polynomial you get is this polynomial with coefficients 1, minus 4, 6, and minus 3. So for example, if you want to figure out in how many different ways you can color this graph using two colors, what you do is you plug in q equals 2. And the value at that point, which is 2 in this case, will tell you there are exactly two different ways of coloring this graph using two colors. Vertices or vertices? Vertices. So what can be said about chromatic polynomial in general? So the expectation was that the, if you look at the coefficients of the chromatic polynomial, which is 1 minus 4, 6 minus 3 in this case, then they should always satisfy this quadratic inequality. ai squared should be larger than the product of its adjacent coefficients, ai minus 1 times ai plus 1. As we all know, well, graph theory is capable of producing many, many hard conjectures. But the, I was particularly attracted to this one because it has a somewhat different feeling. So usually, the conjectures goes like if you have a class of graphs that you call A, or and the conjecture says that the, all graphs in this class have this property. This looks a little bit different. It claims that certain relatively simple numerical inequality should hold for all finite graphs. So in my mind, it felt like that either the statement should be false or have a straightforward or at least a natural proof. So let me explain a little bit more what I mean by that. Um, so if I give you a graph, how would you compute the chromatic polynomial? Essentially, the only way you would go is to perform the following recursion. You start with your graph and pick one of the edges. I'll pick the one on the top, and you form two new graphs. The first graph is obtained by deleting the chosen edge, and the second graph is obtained by contracting the chosen edge. And you observe that the chromatic polynomials of the three graphs are related as follows. The number of ways to color the original graph is the difference of the number of ways to color the deleted graph and the contracted graph. And this tells you. For example, that chromatic polynomial is indeed a polynomial. And this polynomial has integer coefficients. And if you think more carefully, those integer coefficients should alternate in sign, etc. But this algorithmic description or definition of the chromatic polynomial makes the prediction of the previous conjecture rather interesting. Because if you have a sequence of integers which satisfy that low concavity inequality, and if you add or subtract two such sequences, in general, the sequence you get will no longer satisfy that quadratic inequality. So this defining recursion makes 
the prediction of the conjecture quite interesting. Here is the, another variation of the same conjecture. This time you start with a set of vectors and a vector space over whatever field, let's say A. And you associate the configuration of vectors, a sequence Fi, where i entry Fi is the number of independent subsets of A which has size i. So for example, if you pick all seven non-zero vectors in three-dimensional vector space with field of two elements, then you see this picture, the final plane over F2. And F0 here is 1, which corresponds to an empty subset of that seven element set. And F1 is 7, because you see seven points in the P2. And F2 is 7 choose 2, that's 21. F3, that's 7 choose 3 minus 7, because there are seven lines you see in this picture and the corresponding triple of vectors are not linearly independent. So you subtract 7 from 7 to 3. And the sequence you get is 1, 7, 21, 28. And the prediction, well, um, for going that, to convince you that this is a really the same sort of invariant, think of how you would go computing this sequence fi given a configuration a. You will probably go. Uh, apply this recursion. From a given configuration A, you construct two new configuration, where the first configuration is obtained by deleting a chosen vector from your configuration, and the second configuration is obtained by projecting away from the chosen vector and get the new configuration in one lower dimensional vector space. The prediction in this case is that no matter which configuration you start with, the sequence you get should always satisfy this quadratic inequality, low concavity inequality. So as you could guess, these predictions are in fact part of the more general prediction on a more general combinatorial structures. These are combinatorial structures defined by Hassel Whitney, who provided axioms for independence and defined any finite structure adhering to these axioms to be matroids. In short, matroids are finite collection of subsets of a given finite set, which you call independent, which satisfy this axiom, so-called exchange axiom, you have seen in the linear algebra. For example, a graph gives a matroid where you say a subset of its edges is independent if it does not contain any cycle. Then this satisfies the exchange axiom. And a configuration of vectors gives a matroid where you say that a subset of vectors is independent if it is linearly independent. It's a purely combinatorial notion. And this combinatorial structure admits two constructions, the deletion and the contraction. And applying this, the same sort of recursion defines an um, invariant of a matroid, so-called characteristic polynomial of a matroid. And the general prediction is that the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial always satisfy this quadratic inequality. So why would such a quadratic inequality? Um, let me take a brief recursion to the relation with the algebraic geometry. Matroids are interesting combinatorial structures by their own right, but they become more interesting if you start asking questions regarding their relation to algebraic geometry or over uh, some field. You say that a matroid is realizable over field K if you can realize the given abstract independent systems by actually chosen, choosing a collection of vectors in a given vector space over that given field. For example, this matroid, the picture you have seen, is realizable if and only if your field has characteristic two. And this matroid, where you declare that the three points that corresponds to a circle in the previous picture is now linearly independent, is realizable over field k if and only if the characteristic k is not equal to 2. There are a lot of matroids. For example, this one, the collection of nine points, where the top three are dependent, etc., is not realizable over any field, yet it satisfies the exchange axiom. So how many matroids are realizable over field? 
And the answer is that 0% of a matroids are realizable over some field. If you enumerate the class of all matroids and count how many of them are realizable over a field, then asymptotically they go to zero. Also, the testing the realizability of a matroid over a given field is rather difficult. For example, when the base field k equals q, it's known that the this is the same as asking the answer to the Hilbert Pence problem over q. So there are many, many matroids which does not arise over a field. What we figured out with uh, Karim Adiprasito and Eric Katz is that although these matroids do not, may not arise from a field, they behave as if they do arise from a field. Let me be more precise in a minute. But this in particular, the inequalities that I provide uh, proves the low concavity conjectures in their full generality. So I'll, I'll tell you the three fundamental objects that appear in the proof. I'll not apply any algebraic geometry, but the proof is closely modeled on the corresponding facts on the algebraic geometric side. First of all, I'll, I use the fact that a matroid M can be viewed as a certain piecewise linear objects. These are the so-called tropical linear spaces. It's a special class of the tropical varieties, the subject of tropical geometry. These are some examples or pictures of tropical varieties. These are certain polyhedral complexes that satisfy certain properties. What we do with this tropical variety is that we associate a certain graded ring that I'll write by a star of delta. And I'm going to call that ring a cohomology ring. And what's novel is that we also associate uh, to this tropical variety, a certain convex cone which lives in the first graded piece of the cohomology ring. I'm going to call that an ample cone. Here I can do it with Z. Here I will do it with L. So these are certain natural objects that are associated to any tropical variety, natural in the non-technical sense. If you think about these ob objects for a certain time, then you will arrive at these objects. So if you view a matroid as a tropical variety and look at this cohomology ring and associated ample cone, then no matter whether your matroid is realizable or not, you have the following. You pick an element in the ample cone of your matroid, and you pick an integer k. Then first of all, if you're looking at the map given by the multiplication by L in your cohomology ring of a matroid, then it defines an isomorphism between the complementary dimensional cohomology spaces. It's the analog of the hart lefschetz theorem. And secondly, if you look at the kernel of the multiplication by a power of L, one more than the exponent giving the isomorphism, then it defines a certain subspace, the primitive subspace. And if you restrict the bilinear form given by the multiplication to that primitive space, then it defines a definite form of sine minus 1 to the k. That's an analog of the Hodge standard conjecture for algebraic cycles. For these, yes, yes. So is this even only even cohomology? Well, I mean, it's hard to say. It's not the cohomology ring of any algebraic variety. I can define a model where it does ha have uh, odd dimensional cohomology, for example. Mm -hmm. But uh, well, these for these statements, uh, I just look at yes, uh, the PP. So why does this imply the low concavity conjectures? Well, this is essentially because of this uh, equivalence. If you have three numbers a, b, c, then b squared is greater than or equal to a times c, if and only if this 2 by 2 symmetric matrix has a positive determinant. 
What we're doing here is essentially showing that bunch of matrices, one, well, k of them for each choice of your ample class L is positive, positive definite. And in particular, certain two by two matrices are positive definite, and that is what gives the log concavity. And certainly these other inequalities, the higher inequality also produces a certain interesting matroid inequalities. And the argument is a, a good advertisement for tropical geometry to pure combinatorialist, in my opinion, because it goes as follows. If you give me two matroids of, on the same ground set and of the same rank, then I view them as a two tropical varieties, delta m here, delta m prime here. And how the proof goes is like this. We define a certain local modification that we call flip. If you flip a tropical variety, you get another tropical variety. And we prove that, given any two matroids of same size, I can repeatedly flip it to go from one to the other. And we show that the validity of the Keller package, the two assertions that you have seen in the previous slide, are preserved under this local modification process that we call flip. The intermediate objects that you see in this flip sequence are certain tropical varieties with good cohomology rings. They satisfy hard Lefschetz and Hodge standard, but they are not in general tropical varieties associated to a matroid. So in order to prove this matroid state statement, you have to somehow leave the world of matroids and come back. And if you note this analogous story for simplicial polytopes surrounding the G conjecture, then this is in contrast with uh, their case, where you flip a polytope to get another polytope to get another polytope to arrive at the given polytope. There, you never have to leave the world of polytopes. But here, uh, you might have to leave the world of matroids. And in fact, if you set up the problem in the, this tropical context, that case of polytopes arises as a rather special case of our argument. So uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs>